Get this recording going. So there we go. A little bit of last minute confusion there, but assistance pays off like always. Welcome everybody. Hello, so glad to see you all. What a great group we have here. And um, hopefully by the time you leave tonight, you're gonna be invigorated to um, go out into the world and carry truth to victory in this world of fraud and corruption that we live in. So uh, this, this will be one of our training sessions to be truth warriors. So uh, as you know, we're gonna be talking about um, the foreclosure and mortgage fraud scenario. We've talked an awful lot about this over the years. I've done several videos and uh, I'm sure many of you have seen those. Um, if not, they, uh, some of those were linked in the email I sent you today. So you've got some um, other references you'll be able to uh, tap into if this is all new to you, okay? But um, uh, as um, members of the Lighthouse Law Club have had for some time, we've, we've had Paris Dubay uh, as one of our preferred service providers to members for quite some time. And uh, she's here with us tonight. She, uh, she's a certified paralegal. She has experience in the uh, foreclosure fraud industry. <laughs> Perhaps she can tell us a little bit about that. All right. And uh, she's also been an expert witness, used as an expert witness in various courtroom scenarios. So um, what we'd like to do tonight is have uh, Paris kind of uh, uh, help us lead a discussion on understanding what the fraud is on mortgages, what the game is. Um, I sent you a link to a movie that has recently been released called The Con. And uh, boy, is it ever eye-opening very eye-opening to really expose the deliberate uh, property theft is really what it amounts to. Just absolute outright deliberate property theft that's going on in the mortgage industry has been for some time. And uh, just as the Lighthouse Law Club is poised and positioned to stand against fraud and corruption evil doings to help people stand on their rights, protect their property. This is exactly what Paris uh, is involved in, specifically focused on the real estate and mortgage fraud scenarios. So having said that, Paris, welcome. So glad to have you with us. Um, Hi. Uh, so let's start a little bit with, um, tell us about your experience in the mortgage and foreclosure business. I mean, when, when did you first start seeing what was actually going on? I started seeing it in the early 2000s. I was a bankruptcy paralegal. Um, I took some time off, worked in uh, the servicing industry for a little bit, to kind of see what they were doing and saw how the fraud was, was being um, perpetrated there. And then I went over to a foreclosure mill and as a paralegal putting together foreclosure packages. And when they didn't have the documents, they created them. And so that's how I was introduced to it. Then I'm in my own foreclosure and found fraudulent documents in my own foreclosure. And I just started from there. Wow. So if they don't have a document, they create one. Well, they have to. I, that's, I really do urge all of the people watching this to, to go to um, the con and watch it. Because if you understand how it happened and why it happened, then you understand when you get into court why you're fighting and what you're fighting. Um, these are mortgages. There's a lot of predatory lending. There was a lot of appraisal fraud. There was... Um, the predatory lending alone was a huge majority of the problem. They went looking for signatures and they knew you weren't going to be able to pay it, but they didn't care. And what happened was, is they were getting them, bundle, bundling them up and selling them off to Wall Street. But when you're doing that at rapid speeds, you're not following the paperwork. You know, the paperwork's not following you. And it's not till you default and you end up in court that they went, oh crap, we need the documents. So then they just started to create them. So that we have a lot of 
Um, DocX was a big problem. Uh, Nationwide Title Clearing, which is owned by Scientology, they are a huge uh, robo signing uh, document preparer. Um, so what they would do is they would prepare documents under what the attorneys wanted them to do. And when it wasn't correct, the attorneys would do it themselves. And they and I've been able to pinpoint where attorneys are putting fake endorsements on notes to give the illusion of standing. So that's that's yeah. what's going on. So they don't have proper standing. In other words, they, they don't have a legitimate reason to make <clears throat> claims. So if they don't have a reason to make a claim, they, they have no standing to be in court. All right. So um, if the court recognizes that, they would just throw the case out. If the court wasn't as corrupt as everyone else. The yeah. Court, the, yeah. So if you remember back in the mob days, I know we all grew up, you know, watching mob movies and, you know, you would have the mob bosses and you would have the players and then you would have the cops being paid off excuse me for one second <clears throat> excuse me you would have the cops paid off to look the other way that's pretty much what's going on here the judges and the attorneys are looking the other way so the problem has been up until now people weren't presenting the proper evidence we weren't coming after the validity of the documents on a, on a larger front. People were just accepting saying, oh yeah, well, I wrote a note. Yeah, I signed the note. But, um, and these assignments look real and, and that's what they were going on. And, and it's, the courts had no, their hands are tied. And that's what the judges will say. Well, you signed the note, right? You agreed right. to this. this is your signature, so you have to pay. And, exactly. and that's, where, that's where it ends right there. And so that's, that's the argument, uh, case closed. You pay or lose the property. Um, and then you have to, sh what you have to do is you have to show, <coughs> excuse me, what you have to show to the court is number one, you have to change your, your vocabulary. When you go in, don't say chain of title. The title is still in your name. That's never been the problem. You also didn't buy the house from the bank. You borrowed money from the bank and you used the house as collateral. You have to get that in your argument to the court. Because when, when they go in, they're always going to say, oh, well, here's the chain of title and I have the chain of title. Well, no, you're not in the chain of title. I still own the house. What you have to prove and what you have to keep reminding the other side is that you have to pro prove the chain of ownership of the lien. And that has to be valid. So it's still contract law. And, you still, and I'm not an attorney. I'm a paralegal. But you still have to prove that. And if they can't prove that it went from a to B to C and then to whoever's foreclosing on you, then they don't have proper valid um, ownership of the lien. So you have to keep using those kinds of um, words and phrases to the, to the court. And that's what I do with my fact report. I show you all the breaks in the ownership lien, uh, ownership of the lien. Um, you have to make sure the person is authorized to you know, sign the documents that they're signing. You have to make sure that the person actually works for the company that they're signing for. A lot of the companies that along the way have gone belly up, meanwhile, there's still documents being signed in their name. So those are the things that you have to show to the court. They don't own the lien legally. And then when the court says, okay, well, the, the documents, well, we're just gonna throw the documents out and I've seen this happen, where they say, well, don't worry about the documents. They still say they own the lien. They have a copy of the note. Well, no, they don't. They don't have the original note. You can't go in and collect money on a copy of anything. So ask them for the money. Ask them for a receipt of the wire transfer, something other than um, the documents that they're relying on. Yeah, and any adversarial proceeding in the court, each there can be no assumptions or presumptions. The court should not recognize any assumptions or presumptions like you just said, oh, we have the note. Well, put it into the record. Where is it? Produce it. Put it into the record. Okay. If not, if not, then judge, I strike that from the record, that last comment that they have the note because they have not presented it. It doesn't exist as far as this court is concerned. That that's true. And and uh coming to court with a copy is one thing. Now they, and I have seen where they've created what they say are original wet ink notes. So you have to be very careful of, um, of what you're asking for and, and how you're asking for it. 
the, the thing, the most important thing is how they got it because they have to show the paperwork to do it. And the paperwork in the assignments has to match the endorsements. So, and the court has now allowed blank undated endorsements to be okay. And then you have to force that it's not so. And so, so to, um, to be effective of this, like you said, whenever you ask a question in court or otherwise, you should know what the answer is ahead of time. Yes. Right? So yes. You're not never, ask a, never ask a question you don't already know the answer to. Yeah. And so my point is, is that having or knowing what documents they have would come out in the discovery process. So if you did good discovery, then uh, you would know what they have and what they don't have. Correct. I always urge everyone to get QWRs, qualified written requests, um, respond, you know, letters, get them out as soon as possible. And you have to start doing it now. We have a huge wave of foreclosures coming. And, and I just posted today in, because uh, I have a business Facebook as well, I just posted today, now's the time to get your documents together. If you have the copies of your closing documents, get them together. If you have copies, uh, if you have QWR and responses, start pulling all of that together. If you don't have it, send it out because there's a 30 day wait period for you to get a response. Um, because when you may have not paid your mortgage, you may think that you're okay right now. You know, oh, I just didn't pay because of the COVID. Well, the question is, are you even paying the right person anyway, or the right entity? And that's what's going to save you in court, not just the moratorium issue, but you're going to be able to show that the documents that they're giving uh, the court are not valid. Okay. So it comes down to documentation and who really owns the, ne the, the lien. Correct. In other, in other words, who has the claim? to make for the payments that supposedly are not being made. Now I have a question. I was watching, I was watching the con today and they showed, uh, uh, they did an interview with the lady who uh, lost her property. She found the fraud, but it was too late. Uh, she, they were saying it was after a seven year statute of limitations. Now, I've always understood that the Supreme Court in Throckmorton versus the U.S. has been very clear that fraud vitiates all contracts and there is no statute of limitations on fraud. So help me reconcile this. That is, the, that is what we're fighting now. We're, we're kind of coming into the different era of the fight now that people are becoming aware and the courts are becoming aware because they've kind of, the courts have kind of blindly lean toward the banks because homeowners didn't have attorneys that would help them or attorneys didn't know what they were doing. So now that we we're becoming more informed um, and the fraud is there, you can do a, with Becky, that's the lady in the, in the, um, the con, she is probably going to do a RICO case now. <laughs> to show the fraud because she can actually, she actually has the ring. She can put the foreclosure people, the auction house and the, and the buyer all together. So that's what, the, how they're going to do that. As far as the fraud, you just have to keep bringing it before the courts. And until we can get the courts to um, stop being corrupt, I don't know what we're going to do. Well, it's interesting we're talking about corruption in the courts and how this all ties into uh, real estate and mortgages because um, I know of a lady who has uncovered how they bribe the judges. And it's not with sacks of money under the table. What they do is they, they let them take out mortgages and then somebody comes along and mysteriously pays off the mortgage. Wow. So it looks like a legitimate uh, mortgage transaction where they get the money from the bank and they do. So they take out a, a, a real mortgage, get the money from the bank, and then someone comes along, pays off that mortgage in a short period of time. And they do it over and over and over again. And this is how one way how many judges are bribed. And uh, we have, we have um, that presentation and information in the member section for the lighthouse. So uh, that might very well go hand in hand with some of the things we're talking about here. I, I will have to say that was the first time I've heard that angle. 
yeah. for the, the judge being bribed. I, I haven't heard that one yet, but it doesn't surprise me. If there's, there's an old saying, get in where you fit in. So if there's a criminal angle to get money out of any of the homeowners on whatever level it is, somebody's doing it. Now the judges, there's different things, the bonds that back the judges, their pensions, you know, you can always go in and, and uh, have a judge recru recused based on whoever their pension is with and if it's with the, with the plaintiff um, in judicial cases. Um, other judges, I, I don't know, they get skittish. I don't know who's keeping them from doing anything or, or why they won't rule the way they're supposed to I have a case in Washington uh, state where we presented in the pleading that there were two original notes signed by two different people on the originator under the originator's name offered in the same as a response to the same motion and the judge just overlooked it he, he just let it happen so one of the attorneys was presenting a fraudulent um note and he just totally ignored it and um uh, and lifted the stay well you'd have, to, you'd have to object to that and, and save that for appeal i suppose and, which uh, that's what they're doing now yeah yeah Wow, it's uh, it's kind of scary. All right, so you know after after all that's gone on, you know again watching the con and how this has been exposed uh, over the years, um, it's amazing that that this is still going on. It appears that they haven't slowed down at all because we don't get the people in the White House out or in any of the government. Congress, they all. If you watch all of the con you will see they've lifted all regulations over the last 40 years. So all regulations have been lifted and they're just pretty much able to do whatever they wanna do. And <clears throat> those are questions. I'm, I'll try to see if I can get the producers to come and talk to you on that end of it because that's not my part yeah. to, uh, to, to talk about. Um, they're much more educated on that than I am. Um, that's why I tell everyone to watch the con. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay. Um, so tell us then uh, uh, what you do. Um, as far as uh, when someone comes to you for help, tell us about your services and the approach you take and, and, and what has been successful. Have you seen any success with this massive corruption? Let, let me get a drink just a second. Um, what I do is gather information. I have created a paralegal report. So what I do is I take your recorded documents from the time you bought property to current, and I investigate validity, validity issues from the beginning to the end. And, and it's in a way that it starts to bring the crime up front. And it's written in a way for attorneys to be able to narrow discovery, narrow their answers to complaints, <coughs> Excuse me. I also bring in QWR issues, um, responses. I bring in your court cases that you've had prior, bankruptcy, proof of claim, motions to live to stay, and I start to compare all of them. So I prepare a case analysis, basically, and we use that to fight in whatever court you want to go in. The success that we've had so far is number one, everyone's still in their house. So it's enough to get the courts to kind of pay attention and stop because they can't, they don't want to set precedents with what we're doing. Right. You know, it's, so that's um, one thing. The one place that we have a lot of success is in bankruptcy. You take my report and I uncover everybody that's involved, people you don't even realize they're there just by looking at the paperwork. But we list everyone is unsecured in chapter seven we force them to file a, a proof of claim. If they don't file a proof of claim, they obviously can't participate. Um, sometimes they try to file a motion to lift the stay, and I'm right there with the fact report, attacking all of their evidence. We have been able, I've, I have three cases right now that the debt was discharged as unsecured. If there's no discharge, if there's no debt, they can't foreclose. Yeah. The problem that we're, we're having right now is trying to get title companies. One of my clients tried to take out a new loan. He beat Aquin. We got Aquin completely knocked out and there was nothing. And they admit 
on the phone that you don't owe them any money, but they won't put it in writing. And if they don't put it in writing, he can't get another loan because the title company won't write it yet because this is all very new, you know, because so, um, and now he's in a RICO case and he's that's moving forward criminal. on that. Yeah, that's criminal. Yeah. And that's what we're also doing. I can show in the, in the fact report where attorneys are committing felonies by adding um, endorsements, fraudulently creating documents to, to create standing. And so that's another thing you can do. If you, we haven't done that yet, because no one's uh, gutsy enough to do it, you know, to bring criminal charges against attorneys and judges for, for committing fraud and uh, committing felonies. So that's kind of where we're at right now with what I do. Uh, when, when you say nobody's gutsy, you're talking about prosecutors. Right? Yes, it's, yeah, you do. I mean, no one that I know of has gone in to criminal court and filed criminal charges against attorneys or judges. Not yet. That because is in the plan. That's, uh, yeah, that's hard to do because they're going against their own and that's taboo. Yeah. And, and you know, a lot of attorneys are threatened. I've seen very good, very well-known attorneys. There's one in New York that used my fact report and was pushing and was winning in bankruptcy court. And then something happened and she just laid down and my, and my client lost in bankruptcy court. So there was definitely a push. There's a big push in New York right now for some reason, especially in bankruptcy court, not to let anybody win no matter what you bring. We were able to date, I was able to date the endorsement and uh, she was using it. And I was able to show that there was no possible way the date that they said that that endorsement was put on there, that that man did it because he didn't work for the company. And I had proof of it. And uh, not long after that, all of a sudden she just kind of went quiet. So it's, it's a big mountain, but yeah. if all of us get educated and all of us get the right information in front of the courts, it'll be, it'll be good. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of, uh, a little bit of momentum, I guess, yes. you know, to have the, have the people start rising up and, uh, again, send a strong signal that, Hey, we're on to the scam. Yeah. And we're done. In my own case, I got my house back on my fact report um, on a fraudulent document. But four years later, Aquin comes around, gets another attorney, creates another version, the seventh version of my note, and we're at it again. You know, so, but I'm still standing, you know, I'm still here and I'm still fighting. And as long as I'm still fighting, then it's working. Yeah, yeah, still in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I think one of my friends who's on the line here with us, he he does similar work, and uh, you know, nobody ever gets a victory letter to us, you know, that says, "Oh, sorry, you won." Uh, yeah. But he's been in the house for nine years, and uh, you know, kind of a, a silent acquiescence, and that that goes a long way. I've been in my house since 2006. I my first foreclosure was in 2007. Won that. My second one was in 2009, won that. And it, we, it went all the way to, to sale, but it was part of our legal strategy. And then won that. And now four years later, we're at it again. As far as the attorneys, my, and I don't know how many people have heard of Mark Stopa, but Mark Stopa was my attorney for this third one. And he was raided here in Florida. There was a big, a big to do. He was raided and was shut down. So I went back to my original foreclosure attorney. That attorney started getting pushed or pressed upon the Florida by the Florida bar really hard. He, he just, he closed up his, uh, his uh, practice. He put, he sold his house and he moved to Mexico. He said, I'm not doing it. And he got me on the side and he says, I can't do it. He says, I'm not going to go through the rails. They're trying to railroad me and making me look out that I'm bad and I'm not. So and he was winning. So I lost two attorneys in this case already. So I'm on my third set of attorneys. So hopefully they don't uh, get sold out. So going back to a comment you made earlier, you said that um, uh, one of the results is when you prove that they don't have claim to the lien, that they then become unsecured. So that would basically say that the debt obligation would be deemed valid. However, they don't have a claim on the lien to the property, so they can't foreclose. Correct. In bankruptcy, you're either a party of interest or a real party of interest. A party of interest is when you file a proof of claim 
and anyone can do that that you think that you you are money in that from that estate a real party of interest you have to have foreclosing rights you have to have all the rights a secured party would have so that those are the difference between the two and so when you list them at, as unsecured you're forcing them one to, to file the proof of claim because they have to to participate there's also um, a dischargeability they can um, object to the dischargeability if they want to to say no i don't want to be discharged as an unsecured i'm secured and most of them don't do that most of them won't file a proof of claim because in 2017 the court recognized that there was a lot of fraudulent proofs of claim and now they said if you whoever signs a fraudulent proof of claim it's five years in prison and five hundred thousand dollar fine or both that's hefty yeah, so the, a lot of you really do have to force them, and it's a lot of work. It can be done. My clients are doing it, and uh, I saw somebody up here ask if um, if my fact report. What was the difference between my fact report and what a quiet title search is? Quiet titles. I don't know where you stand on it, but I've I've worked with people like Neil Garfield and and others. Quiet title. The original part of that was if you had a, a border issue or not a border issue but a property line issue you know or or something was wrong in the land description or something that's usually what quiet title was to do you just kind of went into court and you both presented your your side and then the judge uh came up with a with a remedy quiet title in some states here in florida it has changed you can do a quiet title and if fraud is involved then you can bring in what we do but you have to remember quiet title actions there is no trial there is no discovery there is nothing you have to one side presents their side you know their story and the other side presents their story and the judge has at it there is no there, so quiet titles are not really a really great way to go we're kind of doing a quiet title in a chapter seven because we're listing everybody from the moment that you bought the house until current. And that way you're putting everybody on, on notice with a federal court. If you have any interest in this house at all, now's the time to say something. And obviously all the other ones will go away or they'll say, oh, we don't have it, we don't have it. So you're kind of doing a quiet title in, in essence in a chapter seven. And then just the last person usually comes in and says, oh, we have it, but now they have to prove the chain of ownership. So they, mm -hmm. they have to properly. Yeah. So in the chapter seven bankruptcy, you list uh, the so-called uh, mortgagor or uh, whoever's collecting or servicing the loan at the moment, wanting the money, you list them as unsecured and force them to prove otherwise, huh? Correct. And they can't, which is beauty of all of it. <laughs> I love it. They can't. I mean, it's it's absolutely brilliant, but um, I, and it's working, you know. It's it, and it's hard. Before anyone goes out there and tries to do a chapter seven on your own, let me let me tell you, filing bankruptcy is very serious, and it's not just your house. So, and not everyone is qualifies for a chapter seven. You know, you really do have to look at your entire estate because it is, it, it is a bankruptcy. So if you have other assets that are out there or have a lot of money in the bank or other property, you really do need to consult with an attorney. At least this is what I tell my clients to get the fact report. We know what we're dealing with. I'll help get your bankruptcy, the, the uh, draft of it together. So I'll ask you all the questions and we'll get it all together. Then go and do three, two or three consultations with attorneys in your jurisdiction. So you can find out what's exempt, what's not exempt. Are you in jeopardy of losing, uh, you know, any properties if you did a chapter seven? And if not, if you go into a 13, you still do the same thing. You still put it all as unsecured. And then in your plan, you put in there that you're retaining the house and upon a valid claim, then you'll discuss how you'll pay off the debt. But you have to force them to show that they have a valid claim. Yeah, and then your question, if they do, now you're discussing uh, uh, renegotiation terms, right? Yeah, and then you ask them, okay, and then if they're third or fourth down the line, you know they're a debt collector anyway, and you know they only paid pennies on the dollar, 
push them to see how much they paid for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really. I mean, and, and that's, if you tell the court, say, listen, because you know, the court wants us all to be deadbeats, right? And we're not deadbeats. We just want to pay the proper person. And we also want to pay a reasonable amount. If like in my case, um, we have, we're finding out that we have proof that my, my loan has already been one, canceled with the IRS. And two, it was already made seven, has been paid off seven different times. So those are different things that I have to bring in. But if you have a debt collector that only paid pennies on the dollar, why are you going to pay, give them all of your equity? Say if you paid $100,000 on a $200,000 loan, let's negotiate the 100000 Hey, I am giving you 125000 So you can make a little bit more money, but you're not going to hand your, all your equity over to a debt collector. No, absolutely not. Okay, interesting. Very interesting. Let's go and uh, uh, maybe look at the questions in the chat. And uh, I know there's, uh, I know Les has had his hand up here. Let's go to Les and uh, see if you got a, you got a question for uh, Ferris, Les? Go ahead, Les. Oh, that was by accident. I, I did that. Oh, okay. All right. All right. How about uh, KJV? You got your hand up? You want to chime in here? Here we go. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you, Mark. Can you hear me? Yeah. Fine. Okay. Go ahead. Excellent. Yeah, I, I didn't know where to, I, I pasted the question in, but I'll read it. So, so the note uh, has a giant X through the endorsement box or area. And it just has a little squiggly, like somebody's initial off to the side. Is there any argument there for validity? I mean, could I just say I can't validate this and remove my signature from the note? I'm not an attorney, so I can't tell you legally, give you any legal advice on it. I have two cases that are exactly like that, and they're arguing it now that um, it's, it doesn't follow contract law. That's the best I can tell you um, as far as the, the X through it and the squiggly. It has yeah, to be. And, and, I wasn't, and I wasn't sure about the semantics of any mark being a signature, you know, but um, clearly their version of accepting it was just an X, which struck me as odd. Is the X through the whole, the whole yeah. endorsement? Uh-huh. Yeah. See, I have, like I said, I have two of those now and I'm waiting to, to see what, how it's going to be played out. I'm not an attorney, so yeah. I don't give legal advice. I don't, I can't tell you what the legalities would be, that would be argued. Uh, what I do is give you that proof. Now, what I would do for you surrounding that X is to show the other information that's involved, you know, the, the assignments that go along with that note, the, um, uh, are there other endorsements on there? Uh, I, not to, to the best of my knowledge, it's been a little while since I looked yeah. at it. I mean, my, my sale date's coming up on the 15th. I've been round and round with these corrupt bar flies. And I can tell you, I'm the, my last motion was to vacate void judgment. And it had uh, validity to that, you know, that motion. Mm -hmm. And they, the court didn't even notif notify me on what they were going to do with my motion. They just went ahead and rubber stamped the, uh, the judgment uh, and with a little note at the bottom saying, yeah, we saw the motion, but it had no merit. <laughs> and I was requesting a different judge, you know, that that one, not, you know, so there was some strange things going on in the courtroom. And, and when I saw that X on the note, they actually produced the original note. So this is a conventional mortgage. It wasn't sold. It went from a mortgage broker to a, to a servicer and supposedly the, the, the owner that's, that has it lodged in a, in a trust. So I did do some forensic audit and I made an effort. And, you know, I, th I really think the system's designed is to wear people down. It is. That, that's yeah. absolutely true. And fortunately, I don't have really any equity to fight for. But man, you know, having a judgment and all that. So I've since gotten smart and learned how to, you know, operate with an unincorporated business trust and just get the hell, personally get the heck out of commerce. But anyway, uh, I just was throwing that out there in the event. Um, 
Boy, I'd be curious. You know, I don't know if I can give you my email. I'd be curious to see. Uh, I think Mark will put up or has my contact information through the club. Okay. Yeah. And, and yeah. you can contact me through there. Thank you for the time. Didn't mean to be so long. Okay. No, I, you're, that's I, fine. I wish I had better answers for you, but not being an attorney but, makes it a little difficult. Another, and if, if it's about buying time, I know that you can file a, an arbitration like in a federal court and take a Liz pendants over. I'm not going to bother because I finally found another place to go if we have to move. But, you know, um, I mean, I'm looking at after they're going to keep the sale open for 30 days because it's a deficiency judgment demanded. And then beyond that, I guess it's the eviction process. Well, um, but you're, you're telling me you could file a, a seven or a 13 where you're listing, uh, you're listing the main supposed creditors as, as unsecured. And that would include the, the mortgage company. And that, correct. and that, that is like a, yeah, they can't get out of that no, when you're, when you're moving into a, a yeah. Huh. Interesting. Okay. okay. Any, any other advice? Uh, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll hush. Uh, I would just say, if you want to continue to fight, most people don't, once they move, they're just like, forget it. I don't want to deal with it. But if you do want to fight or you do want to know what's going on or what went on, um, you know, come talk to me about the fact report. We put it together and then we see if you have a, a good case for a RICO. Um, okay. I've heard, of, I've heard of people actually at least getting compens, you know, uh, uh, an award of some kind, you know, I mean, on the way out, I could be noticing, you know, putting notices in the house. Hey, uh, you know, that we're, that you're on notice that we're going to fight for the house. If we lose yeah. the house, so be it, but maybe there's some monetary gain by coming circling back, you know, um, well, I, that's, that's I will tell you one thing stay in your house as long as you can. Honestly, I had a, a an elderly couple in their 80s uh, leave their house. They got, uh, they got scared and they left. And had they stayed in their house, even though the bankruptcy was over, bankruptcy has a long arm of six months before and six months after, we could have reopened the bankruptcy and gone in for the, the kill on the fraud and, and kind of helped them out and kept them in the house, but they, they left. So um, don't leave your house until the very, very, I mean, literally the sheriffs are on your door and, you know, obviously have a place set up and be smart about it. But, um, oh, and by, by the way, um, before all this happened, I conveyed the deed to another trust of mine and mm -hmm. it, I just find it fascinating how they can just wave a magic wand over all that. Like it never happened. I don't think they, I mean, they're not doing it legally, obviously. I have a lot of people that are telling me that, that they're putting their property in trust. Again, that's not my field of expertise, right. so I can't. Um, Anything about uh, agriculture liens, just trying to get the land so they, you know, they can argue the house, but yeah, you know, anything like that or no, no. It just see, it just seems like whatever you do, most of the time, probably fundamentally is correct, but there's no way to get the enforcement done, and it's so crooked. And I well, think. It's so demoralizing about the whole thing. My, the one good thing about my clients are when they, when they get the fact report, you can't argue facts. My report is not like an audit. A lot of people are like, oh, it's an audit. No, it's not an audit. It is a paralegal case analysis. This is what I would put together if, a client, if a, an attorney came to me and said, I'm getting ready to go fight this foreclosure. I need everything that you can get me on this, on this case. I want to know everything inside and out. That's what this report is. It starts with the, the chain of title and the chain of lien ownership that's recorded because that's supposed to be the, the, the staple in all of this. You know, that's how this was all supposed to work. The chain of um, recorded documents follows the mortgage or the deed of trust, and it's supposed to match up to all the endorsements on the note. And if they don't, then obviously they were bifurcated or it's fraud. So that's where I, I base it. And then I start bringing in everything, all the evidence that the other side brings in. And I've been doing this a long time. Attorneys always screw up. They never, ever look at what they're putting in. They never do any background research. And they, they'll put one version of the note in one case and put a different version of the note in another case. I've seen them do it. So what I do is I gather it all up 
and I put it in a comprehensive report. And you can literally, and, and I have clients that do it, take it and they use that to shop around for attorneys because it, it shows attorneys exactly where all the problems are for that jurisdiction. It is, it is a, it's, what would be the word? I don't even know what the word, I don't cater to one jurisdiction. This is, this is a, a factual report that can be used in any jurisdiction. I pull out all the validity questions in all the documents and then it's up to the attorney or the, the very savvy homeowner to pick out what will work in their court system and, and in their state. Cause not all courts are the same, you know, not all judges are the same. We have judges here in, in Tampa. I'm in Tampa. We have judges here. You can bring one, one set of facts in front of one judge and the same set of facts in front of another judge and no rule completely different because of just who they are. You know, and it's and it's horrible. And I don't know how to tell you that we can change that other than I can empower you to give you the proof, to give you the truth, and you fight it with everything you have. And at least then, you know, you weren't ran over. And, you know, you know, you can go to bed saying, you know what, I gave it my all. But then you can turn around and file, you know, a RICO case or whatever else you want to file. If you want to file criminal charges because you'll have criminal activity inside the fact report, it'll come out. You can do that. It just depends on how much you want to fight. Yeah, and my, rea my reaction to your first comment, KJV, is uh, on the, the signature showing an X and a squiggly through it. For them to make the claim that that is your signature, it would just be logical that they would have to show that that is your commonly used signature. Well, that's where the, that's where the bank signs when they accept right. the note. Okay. So it would, in, in like I said, it, it, if you've now seen that a couple of times, uh, it's gonna be good for the record to see if that has any teeth. You know, we need teeth. <laughs> well, I, I give you we, teeth. I, well, I yeah. want you to contact me because I wanna find those other two cases that I have and see if they're the same parties. Because that's another thing that I do, part of my services, um, which this part is just free is because I, if I can clump together the same, a, a lot of homeowners with the same parties, like right now I'm doing LSF nine and Cal, uh, LSF trust and caliber loans. I have, I think 10 clients now all over the country and I've linked them together so they can go after them. They can, you know, talk amongst themselves. Their attorneys talk amongst themselves. They share their evidence to try to really show that this is a pattern. So they can either, they can go on and, and do a class action suit against them or do whatever they want to do. But then I also, like with you and your ex, through the endorsement, I would connect you with the, the two that I have and say, okay, let's look at the parties. Let's see what's common about the two of them or the three of them and see if there's something that the three of you guys can do, depending on where you are in the, in the country. And let's see if there's any anything that we can do to strengthen all three cases to go after whoever did that because the X's in mine is trying to, it, it's trying to void that endorsement. That's what that big X was. That's the way I'm looking at it. And then they have two other endorsements on there. Like, Oh, don't look at this one over here. Look at these two over here. That was by mistake. Even though that one with the other evidence shows to be the real one. And the other two were just placed on and it's, probably by the attorneys. KJ, was there a name associated with that uh, signature? No, uh, it looked like an, an initial, somebody's initials. Just well, usually underneath the signature, because many signatures are illegible, right? right? There's always a name typed out underneath to indicate whose signature that is. Yeah. That's my I question. Understand. I'll look, I'll look, and, and like I said, it's been a while, but in my mind, I think I've seen it both ways. You know, it's kind of like uh, when it passes a couple of different hands. I want to say perhaps there is a typed or printed name at the bottom, but okay. not 100%. Because there's a maxim in law that basically states that without risk, there is no authority. All right. So when you put your name to a document, you're basically swearing to the fact that, yeah, that's your signature. You agree, you consent, and it's true and accurate. Okay. So someone has to, when they put their name on it, they take the risk 
uh, uh, basically uh, of, of their statement being true or not true. And so uh, my only point is, is if you see some squigglies without a name attached, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's not a valid signature because it's, it's anonymous. It can't, you know, it doesn't point to anybody who's actually taking that risk, which is a maxim of law. And you so, have to have a, uh, you either have to be a great litigator or have a great litigator to, uh, to push that in court. That's another problem with, with our courts. We don't have litigators that are wise enough to, uh, to push it. Yeah. You know, and who is this person? Let's put them up on the stand. Who is this exactly. person? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I went through all of that saying that the attorney is just a, it's just hearsay, you know, he wasn't there, you know, that, that, you know, I mean, there was, there was no due process. I bought some time. This whole COVID thing got me some more time, but it's been an awkward holding pattern. Um, but, um, you know, the, fa the fact that an attorney can just show up, there's nobody on the witness stand, you know, there's no proof that there was money other than there's somebody who attested to the fact there are computer records. Well, that doesn't mean anything, right. you know? So, I mean, it's just, it is, it's just a bunch of very loose, um, not to mention, you know, our, not to mention at least being entitled to all the money flow from private mortgage insurance. Hey, that was my, you know, all this stuff was taken out in our name, right? And then it all benefits the bank, no matter what happens, including, including me being sued for those attorney's fees. So, you know, as I understand it, once that, once that signature goes on that note, that's the money that's, that goes into a special deposit account. They make it into checkbook money by taking it to the Fed window. And that's what gets wired out to the, to the sellers. And they're just doing double, double entry bookkeeping. And when I demand in court, when I demanded the note back, since the order, you know, the judgment went down, they freaked out. They're like, they boogie, they shuffled right out of there. Right. Got nervous. And I said, that belongs to me. It's my property. And they didn't want to cough it up. Um, well, but, most of them. But, I mean, I know there's a lot of theatrics and emotion you don't need to hear all my personalization, but you know, uh, for anybody else on the call that's in the middle of this, yeah, there's just there, there's better times coming. This is, this is, this is one of the roughest damn things out there to go through. And um, it's, it's not stopping either. I, I really do urge all of you to watch the con. It, it just, it is so well written. Um, there's no theatrics. Like the big short was very Hollywooded up, I, I say, um, only so they could sell it. And the reason why you have to watch the con on the internet is because no one wanted to touch it because it is so explosive. And, and I think if you watch it and then you'll really get a, a good grasp and there's no, um, there's no conspiracy. There's no uh, assumptions. It's it's factual. And they and these guys were they did this for six years, digging and talking to people. And so I really, really do want you guys to watch the con. And then yeah, it's well done. Huh? It's well done. Well produced. Uh, it's they they did a wonderful job. The guys are are awesome. Um, so, but that's what I do is I try to help you guys get all the information and so you can present it to the court. And I also have access to a lot of experts across the country. So, you know, so what can I do in the night? I mean, if the sale is scheduled for the, for the 15th of September, I mean, what, what kind of hail Mary is available? For well, the only, the only thing that can stop a, stop a sale is a court order. So you either get one from a state or district court or you file bankruptcy. And if you do file bankruptcy, again, you have to do it cautiously, depending on your income and other assets that you have, and you force them in bankruptcy. It's a little bit more different in bankruptcy because they have to prove that they actually own the debt. And it's a little bit more lax when you're in, in state court or district court. It, it's not a federal court. You really do have to show a chain of ownership that's valid. That makes sense. And I've done over 300 of these things and none of them, I, they just, they don't make sense. I mean, common sense would tell you 
when you start to lay it all out that that they don't own it and it's just um and I, I help with the objections and the oppositions to uh, the opposition to the motion to relieve from stay, the objection to the proof of claim. That's what my fact report is the best at. Um, as soon as they file it, I'm on it and we get it in there and it's usually, um, it gets them to back off. And that's what we're looking for. Yeah. So first, you mentioned that you're looking for people who would be serious and dedicated to want to learn to do this with you. In other words, to kind of duplicate your yourself, create a few clones. You wanna talk about that a little bit? I'm, I'm developing some seminars or some um, how-to videos to try to teach you guys how to do what I do because I can only do like two reports a month or so and I don't, I, and we need more people to do what I do. And you know your case better than anyone else. So. Um, I'm hoping in the next uh, month or two, I'll have these how-to videos or have some seminars that will concentrate on each little aspect of investigating your chain of recorded documents, how to present it in court. Um, again, not an attorney, but I can tell you why you're presenting certain things. You know, um, so that's, that's my next thing. I'm also working on a, um, a workbook this out for people. Okay, great. Should be a great resource. And you know, I think a comment was made in the chats that, you know, an, an attorney is never going to get you what you want. And I tend to agree with that. Sure. Um, even those with good hearts and good intentions, they're not going to go and bite the hand that feeds them. All right, we're going against the money powers, right? Yes. The money powers are the ones that call the shots. And the best success that you can achieve is success that you will get yourself. And it's not that daunting, really. It really is not. It's a mindset. And once people have a fear of going into court, and why? Because they don't know what they're doing. Right. So that's what they fear. They fear appearing stupid or making a mistake or getting clobbered because they don't know what they're doing. And to, to eliminate that, you study a little bit and learn the court procedures, learn how to present your case like Paris is talking about, and that fear goes away. You go in with confidence and, and you yourself will have the best chance of winning than any attorney will have representing you because the attorneys they play footsie with each other, right? Yes. Um, they, they know procedure, and they're good on procedure. Uh, and that procedure involves playing a game with the opposing attorney. And so you're not going to get what you pay for when you get an attorney. If you want to win, you really have to do it yourself. And that's what the Lighthouse is all about, is trying to help people gain the confidence to be able to go into court with enough resources, knowledge, education, and um, and so on. So um, so it all it all fits together. All right. You don't just pick the fruit off of one particular uh, hanging branch. You know, you really have to kind of take in the totality of the circumstances and do it yourself if you really want success. So um, bear that in mind. And it's not that daunting, you know, but it does take some time. It does take some time to uh, build on that knowledge, okay? It doesn't happen overnight. So you have to make that decision, make that commitment. Is that something you wanna do? Uh, maybe you have a, a mortgage case today, uh, tomorrow, you know, it could be a zoning issue on your property. Uh, the next day, you know, you got traffic tickets or uh, you get caught up, uh, you get caught up in one of these crazy uh, uh, riots by accident. You're in the wrong place at the wrong time and something, I mean, the legal system itself, government is predatory. They're broke and they're looking for ways to, to capture some booty, okay? And uh, they're looking for customers, wherever they can find them. Drag you into court, strip you down, take what you got, kick you out, and go on to the next one. That's what government's doing. So uh, I don't think there's any better education that you can have is just learning to protect yourself legally. And again, that's what the Lighthouse Law Club is all about. And that's uh, one reason we bring in Paris with her specialty uh, knowledge and expertise 
to fill in that gap for us. Uh, and we have other, uh, other um, preferred uh, service providers that deal in other areas, uh, status correction. Um, you know, we highly recommend the uh, uh, state's assemblies. Uh, someone mentioned uh, taking this to common law court. We all need to get more actively involved in that uh, movement. So there's so many things that we can be doing. But um, so Paris, you say in the next month or two, you'll have, uh, you'll have your, your workbook or your a couple seminars ready? I'm going to have a couple seminars ready. I, I definitely want to teach people how to be their own paralegal. If you're your own paralegal, um, then the rest is pretty much easy because let's face it, paralegals do all the work anyway. So uh, my suggestion is get a good um, rules of civil procedure book and start reading it because that is where all the homeowners mess up is the rules of civil procedure. And you can get them at any law library. You can get them online now. Um, maybe I'll send you a link, Mark, to where homeowners can get those. You need a, a state court and a federal court, depending on which one you wanna go into. And, and it looks like a lot, but it, it really isn't. You just kind of hone in on the ones that you need at the moment. And I'm gonna teach you a little bit, of, I'm gonna try to teach homeowners tricks on how to stay focused and, and uh, not get caught up in the weeds and the emotion in your, in your case. Um, I also have a gigantic network of homeowners that are so savvy and that have fought and won. They're like, they're better than most attorneys that I know. And they have no problem putting their stuff up on, on their websites. They have no problem talking to any homeowners that I send to them and saying, listen, these guys are in, judicial, in a non-judicial uh, state. Tell them the processes and they'll tell them and they'll help them with the, the formatting and, and whatever. And then they come back to me and they use my facts to put in those forms. So I, I do the same thing, you know, kind of like what your law club's doing is just trying to all of us to work together and, and play the game right. Yeah. And that's exactly <laughs> what we tried to do with, uh, with the law club from the very beginning is, um, the great, the, really the greatest benefit is interacting with other members who have had the experience before right? and learning from them. You know, because attorneys aren't going to do it. They, they just, like I, I mentioned Mark Stopa earlier in, in this, he, um, great attorney, but he got a little over his head and then he was taking advantage. The only reason you become a victim is because you, you don't know you have no knowledge of what you're doing. And that's how it's so easy for you to become a victim. My goal in all of, the, of this is for you not to be a victim. I can't guarantee a win because no one can guarantee a win. The only one that can guarantee a win is the judge. But I can empower you and I can give you all the right tools to go in there and stand toe to toe with the big bang. And you can, for the most part, push them back on their butt. And make you know, and get the get the judges to pay attention. I just some jurisdictions are more corrupt than others. Yeah, and we have solutions for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's an ongoing process. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so what's what's the deal? How do we proceed from here? All right, as I mentioned, um, Paris has been one of our preferred service providers for quite some time been uh, dealing with our members uh, very well. We've got a, a huge amount of resources. Um, in addition to this approach, there are many other approaches in dealing with property. Someone mentioned uh, trusts. We really specialize in that area. We have the ability to, um, through the World Mission Church, help people set up a ministry and become exempt through uh, a ministry form of trust, kind of an additional layer. Uh, we've got um, approaches to move real estate from the public to the private, and that has some fantastic uh, benefits. Um, of course, I think many of us know that, that the mortgage lender never really gave you a loan of money of their own, from their own account, because you created the money when you signed the note there's an approach to attack them on that. Um, there are ways of going after damages by creating an affidavit of obligation, and that's through uh, the tacit procurement of uh, confessions. 
uh, which is a very interesting approach. And we take that, put that into a declaratory judgment uh, procedure in court. Um, so there's a number of different approaches. What we'll do is we'll do a follow-up session next week and we'll drill down into some of these uh, alternate um, tools that we have in the toolbox, okay? But for right now, uh, why don't we wrap it up and let me just say that those of you who are not members of the Lighthouse, you really should give it some strong consideration. And you're probably well aware already, um, been hanging around seeing us for quite some time. But what we've done is we've made it extremely easy for people to join, okay? We've got two ways to do that. We have a one-time lifetime uh, fee of $1,950, which we've waived if you join our community support network. Let me just go there if I can. And um, all you do there is make a $25 donation to someone who's in the community. It's, uh, it's a gifting program. And we also have developed a number of communities within this community uh, dealing with a number of different areas of interests. One specializes in trusts, another one uh, focuses on gold, another one on business building. Um, and so the Community Support Network, all we ask, we want this information to go viral, okay? Whether you're interested in the Community Support Network or not, maybe it's only the information you get with the Lighthouse Law Club, all right? People need to know and have this information. So we want it to go viral. Community Support Network is really a three by 10 uh, matrix gifting program, which has as, Tre tremendous additional benefits. The community center, which I just mentioned, we have eight different communities where people go to learn and advance their knowledge in these different areas and developing uh, passive cash flow for the purposes of becoming economically independent. We've got to get out of this slave uh, condition that the central bankers have us in, okay? Um, and with the way the economy is going, with the social, social uh, support networks um, uh, evaporating, you know, unemployment and forbearance on uh, evictions and foreclosures and the like with what's going on in the economy, people need an alternative. All right. So generating passive cash flow is the focus of the community support network. So bottom line. Join Community Support Network at csn.world, 25 bucks, one time, you get that back with your first referral and, and there's no out of pocket. And when you get two referrals who each have two referrals, you get the Lighthouse Law Club membership, $2,000 membership for free, okay? So help us make this go viral and uh, it all works together. I mean, all of this works together and it can start right here with the Community Support Network. You get your access to the Lighthouse Law Club, learn how to set up uh, trusts, um, be able to add to that a layer of immunity by setting up your own ministry, moving from the public into the private and the list just goes on, okay? I don't think I need to probably go through the entire list. It's all there on the, uh, on the website, so. That's the way to um, uh, get tapped in, either through the normal route with the membership fee, or we'll waive that for you, join the community support network and, um, and just plug in. That's all we really have to do. So with that, then uh, obviously you'll have access to, uh, to Paris and uh, all of her material and other preferred uh, providers that we have. And, uh, that's how it works. So I encourage you all to take advantage of it. I don't think there's a better value anywhere else in the world, quite honestly. So uh, Paris, any final comments? Uh, start gathering your information now, everyone. Start building your cases. Even if you don't have a foreclosure pending, you still need to know who you're paying. You need to know that everything is on the up and up. Always keep them on their toes. 
and watch the con. Get informed. Spread spread the word. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you very much for your time, Paris, and for your, uh, your energy. We need uh, we need more concerned uh, Americans like you who are actually taking a stand against fraud and corruption. And uh, hopefully we've got a few converts here tonight. <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, you all just uh, contact me through Mark if you have any other questions, and that way I can have a one-on-one -on -one and try to answer the questions to him. Very good. All right. Thank you, Paris. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. We'll sign off for now, and uh, we'll be uh, back here next week. You'll all be invited to join uh, next week, where we'll get into some of these other areas and other approaches on dealing with uh, dealing with real estate. So uh, I've mentioned them. So I uh, hope to see you again next week. All right. Thank you. All right.